Look I jacking, hey. Look I jacking, hey. Living in a system of pagan. Every time you get paid, pagan. Living in a system of pagan. Every time you get paid, pagan. Look I jacking, hey. Look I jacking. Every Sunday come them down the altar. Preach at on the truth away him altar. Look I jacking. Hey, look I jacking. Hey. Brown. Fire, fire, fire. words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. Selah. The secret, sacred science behind altars. Let's talk about it. So greetings family. <coughs> We're going to talk about altars today you would have heard some music early on um, from the brothers midnight akabaka who's the lead singer rest in power rise in power rest in peace give thanks for those that don't know him midnight is a band originally out of st croix and um, in later years, the lead, one of the lead singers named Akabaka, at least that's how I pronounce it, um, would go off on his own and um, sing the same style of music, but he is a voice that's very well known. But originally, he was part of the group called Midnight. And one of his famous songs um, from his earlier albums, I think the album title was 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 Pagan Pagan, but the song on the album is entitled Pagan Pagan, and he has a line, a verse within this that says, "Every Sunday come them gone, alter preacher know the truth is what they alter. Look high, ja King, hey." Look I ja King. Hey. So obviously you need to go and listen to how he verbalizes it in the rhythm and in the melody. But in particular, there he talks in part about the term altar. And he gives the wordplay. Okay, as he would say, the hieroglyphics on that term, altar. Obviously referring to the preachers in church and, out, and other religious organizations but in terms of Sunday that they go to the altar but even though they may know the truth that's what they alter okay in, in English they call that a homophone the same word but with different meanings okay so we are going to look at the sacred secret sacred science behind altars so this video i've been wanting to do for quite some while and as with any information that we channel that comes out through us it's taken a while to actually give birth to it um, i'm out here in nature in a quiet spot trying to find a quiet spot before me i see the leaves rustling you might be able to hear them I see a squirrel jumping. Um, I'm based in London, so hence we have squirrels. Lots of birds. And this relates directly to the higher science of what we're going to talk about. Hopefully this isn't too long of a video. 
because the reasoning actually could be summed up in one or a few sentences. But nevertheless, let's get on with it. But I want you to keep in mind what Midnight has said in this song, Pagan, Pagan, as we, as we reason on this topic of the secret, sacred science of altars. So, as we know, you may know from your own common knowledge that an altar, A-L-T-A-R, is something, an object that has been used across religions, across cultures, from ancient history. So in this little image that I have, you see at the top left, uh, a sun, an altar that was in the, the tomb of Hatshepsut, <coughs> which I'm going to focus on a little bit later. Okay, so this is an, an Egyptian or ancient Egyptian example of an altar. And on the right, top right, you have an example of a altar in a Hindu temple. And on the left, you have an altar uh, in a Roman Catholic church. I believe this is one of the top Roman Catholic church. I should have written down the name, but it's one of the top Roman Catholics, Catholic churches in Rome, the head, headquarters of the Roman Catholic in the Vatican. Um, you can look it up, just type in altars and you'll see that one come up, okay? And on the bottom, you see an altar within the Buddhist tradition. And you can see the Buddha, image of the Buddha, sitting behind the, the altar. And this is to show that I could have put a lot more across other religions, uh, Yoruba, you know, other African religions, non-traditional religions, that altars are ubiquitous. Even those people that don't practice a so-called traditional religion, for example, you might say the Wiccans and, and uh, witches and warlocks and whatever. The concept of an altar is something that has been seen across humanity and for millennium it might have been called by different names of course and that would be interesting but the actual physical object of an altar is there so we must see that there that this 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 manifestation is important to humanity in some way now before i go on this reasoning is not going to be a historical research factual it will present some facts but it's not going to be a logical left brain presentation of altars and their history and the, the dimensions and you know the relationship to the different religions and things like that it's going to be a conscious spiritual connection with altars and what they mean to us as human beings as living beings so i want you to keep that in mind if you want to go and do your own research on altars as physical objects in terms of history the, the archival archaeological ethnographic aspects definitely that's a very interesting approach but i'm looking at it from the spiritual component Okay, the metaphysical, if you if you can, the esoteric aspects. So first, before we've established that altars have been used across humanity, across cultures, and across time and space by humanity. I think that's clear and evident so far. So when we look at the etymolo etymology of the word altar. This is taken from the online etymological dictionary, which I like to use. You can see that the word altar <coughs> is related to altar with an E. But you see it says Old English altar from Latin altar, meaning high altar, altar for sacrifice to the great gods, perhaps originally meaning burnt offering, offerings. 
and you com they're comparing it to the Latin adular, adular, which means to worship, you know, to adore, basically, to offer sacrifice, to honor by burning sacrifices too, but influenced by a Latin altus, high. And so I've underlined those terms there because that is the root of what an altar is. It is a place where sacrifices and worship is completed by the way usually of burning sacrifices too. And in addition to that, altars are normally high, okay, meaning they're off the ground, okay? So if you keep this in mind, this is the basic first secret science behind altars, okay? Um, I'm out in nature, so sorry, you, you might see me move a bit of the insects and, and living creatures, uh, move them on because they want to join in the conversation. So, burning sacrifices too. It's a place where sacrifices are burned and it's a place that is raised, okay, or high, Latin altus, okay, like Atlas. You know, it's something that's high. Atlas Mountains, it's high, altitude, okay? So this is the, the first secret science behind this construction, okay? Now, although it's referred to in the Latin, we know that the Latin, which comes out of Rome, um, that their root is Greek, and the root of the Greeks is Egyptian. So we, we probably could trace that back if we were to do that type of research that I spoke about earlier to the other languages that gave rise to this, okay? But for this purpose, we can clearly see that there is a commonality of the altars that I showed earlier, if I flick back, that we can see that for the Hindu altar, the Buddhist altar, and the Roman Catholic altar, that we know most of us from common knowledge that sacrifices are made at those places, the places where people come to worship. And normally in today's world, the sacrifices form the burnt offering such as incense. And that is common between the Hindu, the Buddhist, and the Roman Catholic where they will burn incense, as well as obviously in the Orthodox churches and, and other, other churches, that's candles will be used as we know within African tradition, traditional religion, people will burn candles or fires at the altars, okay? And including in the Egyptian example, ancient Egyptian example, which we're gonna look at more in detail a little bit later, this concept of burning and offering is important and critical to the formation of an altar. The second part of the definition we saw was something that's raised and in each example here, you can see within the Egyptian, the Catholic, the Hindu, the Buddhist, all of them are raised off the ground, okay? So we're taking that on board as the secret science behind altars. We haven't talked about the sacred yet, but the secret science behind altars is to have a raised platform where burned sacrifices are made, okay? And we will look a bit deeper. The sacred side, of course, relates to the burning of sacrifices, but what makes some an altar sacred before you even wanna burn a sacrifice there? That's something we need to explore a little bit later. So we've talked about the secret science but we're gonna talk a little bit later about the sacred aspect as well. So if you look here, I've made this little drawing, okay? Just a rudimentary drawing on my computer of an example of an altar. And I just put various objects on it that you might find in an altar. You know, I put a gong or uh, some, some liquid, whether it's water, a crystal of some sort, a plant, two plants, living things, and a candle. Okay, just little things. If I was designing an altar, I might have those things on my altar, you know, 
different things that represent the four basic elements water air fire and earth water being in the liquid fire being the candle earth being the the, the plants and the crystal okay and um and air of course as well with the with the candle um, as well so this is a typical altar but more importantly in terms of what is on the altar because that will change according to the cultures is this is the geo metric the geo spiritual design of the altar and you can see that I've put some lines going through to show the different dimensions the first dimension will be from left to right what we call in mathematics the x axis okay that might represent length the second dimension will be from top to bottom and that will represent the y axis and that will represent height okay and then going diagonally I'm not that great of an artist or computer, but you can see almost a three-dimensional aspect been given to this to this altar, um, this table, this table which is functioning as an altar, which is something now that's going to give it depth. Okay, it's going to give the the altar depth. Okay, and of course the fourth dimension will be existence, meaning time. So altars really. <coughs> When we look now at the, the, the secret science behind it, as I mentioned earlier, is something that is raised off the ground. And really what they are are just physical meditations. Okay, And this is where the different objects come in on top of the altar because an altar can have anything on top of it. It's up to you, it's up to the cultural man, uh, manifestation and expression. And those physical objects are really just thoughts. Okay? The thoughts. So, for example, if someone puts pictures of their ancestors on the altar, well, what they're doing is they're physically representing the remembrance and the power and the, the life of their ancestors. If someone puts a plant on the altar, what they're doing is the they're physically trying to channel and represent, you know, life and the power of life and, and uh, you know, spirit and things like that. If someone puts a crystal, you know, they're physically trying to channel the energy of the earth and the power within the crystal. But it's what they think of. If they're burning incense, it's what they've thought of. It's the specific smell that they've thought of because physical objects hold and represent memories for us the best example you know not the best but one example i can give for example um is a crystal a crystal is is atomic memory so it's happening chemical happenings that come about and in the process of coming about form crystalline structures which are encapsulated and mem and caught as memories in their structure because no no two crystals are alike yeah depending on the environmental conditions and the chemical composition you might put a plant on the altar well what's the plant represent it represents whatever you're feeding it whatever's in the atmosphere whatever light it's got it's a it's a memory of a happening okay of a physical happening so an altar is a place that physical meditations can be placed and 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 activated okay through our interactions with them okay that's what they are so and you raise them up because we're saying that being on high is very important to the secret science be behind altars the secret science behind altars is that you raise them up and so you put these physical meditations these objects thoughts perceptions these realities and memories on a raised platform okay in order to to honor them 
that's what you're doing. You're raising them up in order to honor them. The same way you will see in some traditions, you know, in African traditions, you know, in the Lion King, when the baby cup was born, somebody, they raised them up to the sun, to the, to the heavens, to the ancestors. And so that's what you're doing. You're raising up these physical manifestations, okay? So sacred now. Where does the sacred aspect come in? Okay. Um, when we look at the sacred aspect and we look at the etymological origins of the word sacred, we see that sacred comes from the verb sacrum, the Latin sacrare, to make sacred or to consecrate, to hold sacred, immortalize, set apart and dedicate. And from the, the, the root of it, okay, the Proto-Indo-European root, <coughs> sac, <coughs> to sanctify. So to make something sacred is to sanctify it, okay? So by raising these things up, this is where the secret, sacred science comes in, just by raising it. So when that crystal's on the ground, it's not sacred, but once you've raised it up, it becomes sacred. When you hold that glass up and you hold it up, the glass of, of, of wine or, or liquid becomes sacred, okay? When you put the gong or, or you know, the candle and you put it up, it becomes sacred, okay? So this is the secret, sacred science behind altars that we raise up these physical meditations depending on our cultural reality, our thoughts, perceptions, our memories, and we make them sacred in the act of raising them up above others, okay? And this is something that, that we need to look a bit deeper at. So here you see on the screen a white background, okay? So the white rep background in this case represents nothingness, okay? A lack of existence. So I want you to imagine this white background with nothing on it. And right in the middle now, I have placed a black dot. I could have made it smaller, but I wanted people to see the, the black dot. Okay, I've placed a black dot. And um, now there is existence within the non-existence. Okay, there's existence within the non-existence. We've made a physical manifestation within the non-existence. Okay, so what we're doing in the higher science now is the same thing on the altar. Okay. Within the non-existence of that table, that plane, that altar, that high space, before anything was on it, there was nothing. And so then we place objects, just like that black dot, and they now become separate. They become s significant within the, the empty space, okay? Just through their existence alone, okay? So this is the, 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 the geometric spiritual significance of the altar on a, on a metaphysical, on a meta-conscious level of what we are doing and why humans have done this over time. Okay, changing a plain space and just raising an object into that space and thereby you give it importance. It's the same thing when you look at the universe because really we're going to take it higher now and look at it in a higher dimension that the universe is like that. The multiverse, whatever you want to call it. In this case, I have a picture of, of looking out into space and you see all of the stars, trillions and trillions of galaxies or, you know, immeasurable within that, that non-existence. And just by their existence being raised up, their non-existence -ex being raised up out of their non-existence, they become on high, they become sanctified. So, and for me, the reality is that the human altar, the human altars are just a copy of the universal altar, okay? As with most things with humans, it's just a copy of what we see around us, the higher science that we see around us that we're still trying to figure out to this day. 
okay? And if we only go within and not without, we can actually get to the deeper root of the meanings. But what we do is we tend to go to the shallow side. And that's what the altars are. They are the physical side, okay? Not to say that they're not important, but we're looking at the secret, sacred science behind it, okay? So with this and with this, I'm showing that on a geometric spiritual plane, what an altar truly represents. Okay, so we need to keep these things in mind. One, that an altar is a, is a plain place, plain, P-L-A-N-E and P-L-A-I-N. Okay, that we raise on high and by placing objects on it, they're sanctified and set apart. And these objects represent physical meditations or memories and thoughts and perceptions. Okay, manifested in physical objects. So with this understanding, this overstanding, let's keep going forward and looking at this. So now when we look at these actual examples in human life of altars, it gives us a better understanding of, of, of their importance. Because now we can look at culturally what was raised on high by those different cultures and thereby what is being sanctified within their multiverse. Okay? Where there's fruits and, and, and incense in the Hindu and in the, in the Eastern tradition. Okay? Whether it's here in the but you would have on the, the Catholic, you'd have the Bible, you'd have the Holy Communion, uh, which is incredibly sacred to the mystical tradition of the Catholic tradition, Catholic religion, Catholic faith. These things are raised on high. Now we can see why, because they represent the meditations physically, the thoughts and perceptions and the memories of the things that they want to bring about in the physical plane. And as we said, we're going to look more deeply at the Egyptian um, example a little bit later, okay, um, in, this, this, in this reasoning, okay. And this is not the only place that we see this within human life, okay. So for example, in this picture on the left, you'll see a bar setting. And as we know, people who go to bars, they might know about bars, there's come to something called the top shelf. The top shelf cha uh, contains the choice liquor, okay? The liquor that is very expensive and that is revered, that only, only the most, the most well-educated uh, 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 drinkers, the connoisseurs, or those that have the money can afford to drink. So, they've, so it's like an altar. Okay? It's been sanctified because it's been raised. Okay? The pulpit. So you can see here a pulpit within a church, Christian church. Well, what are they raising up? They're raising the preacher because the preacher is sanctified as well as the Word, the Bible, the Word of God. And he represents the representative of God and he's preaching the Word. So they've raised him up and, and sanctified him. Okay? And even on a mundane level, when we look at things like the... the on, a, on sports, look at the, the, the basketball hoop. On this in this case, we have a um, cricket stumps. And on the top, um, we have the, the um, um, I'm trying to remember what they're called now, it slipped my mind. But on top of the stumps, you have the, 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 the little sticks that if they're hit, that if they're hit off, okay, if they're hit off, then that means you're out. Okay, so they're raised up off of the ground. You can even look, and they've, they, it's a trinity. Okay, three stumps. Okay, and they're raised up off of the ground. That if the if the the bales, that's what they're called, the bales. If the bales are hit off by the ball, then you're out. So the bales have been made sacred. They've been sanctified on that altar. And finally, we all know in our homes, especially stately homes, if you have a very stately home, that the, the altar, sorry, the, um, the, the, above the fireplace, the mantle, is where we put our most precious objects, like our pictures of our family, 
or awards, okay? Or in Christmas time, people put the stockings because these are the things that are raised up and sanctified. So this, uh, this idea of an altar and of physical things being raised up is something that the secret, sacred science we can see manifested through all aspects of human life. And if you th keep thinking, you will see many, many examples. When you look at things now, you're going to be saying, oh yeah, there's an example, there's an example. It all stems from that, that secret, sacred science of raising things up on high. <clears throat> okay? And even within the natural world, humans are in the natural world, but even within the natural world, you can see this sort of metaphysical science spread throughout nature. Okay? So for example, the bower bird, he will build, the male bower bird will build a, a nest, but it's not a nest for the, for the female to really lay her eggs in, it's a nest to attract. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a layer, a, a, a um, sort of area, okay? to attract the female and he decorates it with different objects, very colorful objects. Okay, and it's not the only creature that does this, but it, in a sense, they're using that physical plane and they're bringing objects into it to make it a sacred space, a special place, in this case for the mate, because the mate, obviously, the, the, the transition of new life for the animal kingdom is the most important act, the most important act, the most sacred act is the transition of new life. And so this altar has been made to attract the, the mate. So what I'm trying to show is that this secret, sacred science has, has spread out into many aspects of not only human life, but in our universal life, even to the universe itself. Okay, to the universe itself and the divine intelligence that we see that exists in whatever form you want to say it, it's not here to argue about that but what exists we can see these examples so when we look now as we move to the end of this this reason and we look at the the temple of Hatshepsut okay in Egypt apologies if I pronounced that wrong but as I said if you want to go and do more in-depth research feel free to do that okay but when we look at this uh, the temple of Hatshepsut okay in Egypt it was built around 2050 BC according to what I was able to find out okay and in this temple was actually um, what they call a mortuary temple so it was a temple located next to a burial place in this case Hatshepsut who was a pharaoh she was a female pharaoh okay um, it was built on the site of an existing um, mortuary temple, and she kind of modeled that. But in this case, there was a an altar placed within the, the sun room, okay? And it says here that they call it the altar courtyard, okay? It's open to the sunlight. The courtyard dominated by a huge limestone altar, which every day was touched by the sun rays. This part of the complex is dedicated to the diurnal journal, journey of the sun in the sky. I want you to remember and reference back to all of the, the discussion we just had on altars and how what they represent and how they represent the sacred and secret science behind them, okay? And so this is saying that this particular altar was dedicated to the sun, okay? Specifically the day journey of the sun because they had a nighttime one also and that the main deity worship in the complex of the sun was Amun-Ra, okay, Amun-Re, excuse me, so representing the sort of the, the most high, you know, divine presence, as well as the sun, as well as two other, <coughs> act two other aspects of Egyptian deification, Atum, Amun, and ra Harakiti. okay, so, and it says here, they were nothing more than three different aspects and forms of the solar god complementing each other and then it shows here that the rituals represented on the complex walls were performed by the king or the pharaoh which once again stressed the role of the pharaoh as the heir of the sun 
God. So at this altar, remember we're talking about 2050 BC, the Pharaoh would have been performing rituals which are still present on the, on the walls and de which demonstrate the rituals. Okay, So we need to look more closely at what these rituals were so we can understand, as I said, well, how were these altars, which are just rocks, or just planes in this case, plain, P-L-A-I-N, how were they made sacred? Okay, so, and what were the rituals? So I'm just going to switch to my internet very quickly. So it says here, what were the daily offering rituals? And this is from the from UCL, okay, so a very reputable site of Egyptologists who would have gone and studied. And it says, in ancient Egypt, every day in every temple, specially designated per persons performed a ritual focused on making offerings of food, drink, clothing, and ointment to a divine being, okay, made accessible in the form of images. So here you can see again, that the origin of the word altar meant to make offerings, in that case, burnt offerings. And here, they, you can see that they have evidence that these same things were being done. Okay, And if you look down the bottom here, it says what type of offerings? Well, it says it began with the burning of incense before going to the shrine. And here's, a, here's an incense burner. Okay, Then the sealed shrine is then opened by breaking the seal and untying the cord around the doorknobs. <coughs> Excuse me. And then it says the person conducting the ritual bows in front of the image of the deity with two main gestures, kissing the ground, raising arms while singing hymns. Okay, and then again it says offerings of incense and scented oil are made. Okay, and then it goes into more in detail. But you can see that these altars, the 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 that the that they were made sacred through these rituals of burning offerings and what were these offerings they were objects of different memories of different physical manifestation in this case it was the offerings of incense and scented oils okay and so that's how they were made sacred so when we look a bit deeper it talks about this opening of the mouth ritual one of the opening of the mouth rituals and here I'm just going to skim through. It says, in the ritual, spe specially designated person use special ritual tools to touch the mouth and eyes of the image to enable a spirit to receive food and drink, to breathe and to see. The ritual illustrates a concept of sculpture as birth. And this is what we're talking about. How do you bring the physical to life? How is this altar become sacred? This concept also finds expression in the Egyptian language. In its vocabulary for sculpture, the fashioning of the image is giving birth. Okay, and then the special ritual implements for consecration. Here says that the offerings would have involved an outpouring of blood that invokes implicitly the blood of childbirth and of life. Okay, so we're talking about how these things were made sacred, how these altars are made sacred, and so something some things uh, are common through all of this, okay, which are the uses of images, of special tools, okay, of giving food and drink, of blood or life, okay, so not just physical objects but also living objects. Okay, and burning things in order to make those altars sacred. To make those altars sacred. As well as here, the opening of the mouth ritual, here it says, a word of uncertain origin, original meaning, was reinterpreted, interpreted, reinterpreted in later periods as splitter of his car spirit. In other words, oh, this is on the forked blade. But... I was going to point down to that, well, I'd said it on the other um, site that describes the ritual that they were using words as well, okay? So when we think about altars 
and we look at the ancient manifestations of altars and how they were used and how they were made sacred. In reality, you might have people out there saying, oh, that's pagan. You know, that's blood worship. That's this, that's that. The reality is that there's no real difference between the altar of the ancients and the altars of today. You have the burning offerings. You have the sacrifices being made. You have the uttering of sacred words. And you have them being raised on high. In this case of the ancient Egyptians, of course, the life giver as the sun itself, the light, the light from the sun would fall on the altar. So they're raising up the light of the sun on the altar itself, showing that the light itself is sacred to them. Okay? So we're looking at the secret, sacred science behind altars. Okay? And look at how it's moved through time but hasn't really changed that much. So if this is something you wanted to use and, and, and manifest, there's no no real, you know, specific secret behind it re in reality. And that's what I talk about in my last slide. And now we're gonna take it a bit higher now, okay? And a bit deeper because the root of an altar is to raise high and to make it sacred as we said we need to set things apart and previously what did people use they would use the burning of offerings they might use sacred words okay just the aspect of raising things on high itself would make something sacred would consecrate it dedicate it okay that's where the words came from you dedicate something but when we look more deeply and we look at, like I said, we look at the universe. <coughs> in reality, the human body itself, in the design of the divine intelligence, what is at its highest point? What's been raised high within us? Well, physically, that would be the brain and the mind and the consciousness. In a tree, you would see that would be the leaves, the things that intercept the light. So in, in fact, looking at the universal law that I expressed earlier in terms of altars, that which is raised high and sanctified within us is our consciousness. Okay? It's up to us to recognize that we are living altars. Living altars. Okay? How sacred they are depends on what we do to dedicate or livicate, consecrate, set apart, to make sacred for ourselves. You can offer yourself the sacred breath, the air, the sun. You can live amongst the trees and make your altar and not so much the brain, because in here they have the tree acting as the brain, okay? Because in the reality now, we can go beyond that also. And we know that the physical body will perish at some point and return, okay? So in reality, just like those objects on the physical altar, the crystals, the candle will burn out, the incense will burn out, the food will go rotten and has to re be replaced. That's the same with this body as a physical altar. A more divine, more spiritual concept now is to look at the, the existence and non-existence of yourself. That which is not ageable that which is not able to be broken down with time, that which is endless. And if we can raise that on high, that oneness that has existed from the beginning, as we said, 
on that plane because without that plane that white plane meaning that nothingness you can call it all white or you can call it all black <coughs> it doesn't matter without that there is nothing that could be put on top of that so it's that essence that really is what we need to hold as sacred okay and this really is the secret sacred science is that of altars is that the reality is that an altar has power because we give it power out of respect of course we hold these places as holy within the Hindu tradition within the Buddhist tradition within the Christian tradition within the, the Egyptian Kemetic ancient Egyptian tradition within the Yoruba West African traditional religions whatever tradition we hold them as sacred and we should give respect okay because as above so below but ultimately we need to understand that they hold no power over us we give them the power and the ultimate power comes from raising your eternal consciousness and sanctifying that and raising that up and making offerings to that and once you're able to do that and I'm not here evangelizing because it's work of course that we're all trying to do but once you do that you then can see that every living thing and non-living thing then becomes also sacred as well the danger in having separate altars is as we see people tend to think that oh this altar is more sacred than that one and of course wars can be started over that Mecca is more sacred than Rome and uh, uh, um, you know um, the Buddhist temple in Tibet is more sacred than the Hindu temple in Punjab the Yoruba shrine is more sacred than the Mandinka shrine and all of these comparisons when in reality it's humans that give them the power and if we're able to see beyond that and see where the true altar is the true high altar as it says okay, the true high altar is within the universal consciousness within all things then really we can ascend to a higher way of thinking give thanks I'm David Roots love